Welcome to another session of uh, the Chicago Best Ideas series. I thought I would start with a little bit of context. I know some of you have probably been to others, but um, it turns out that they have evolved. The, the lectures have evolved over the years. They were originally uh, the, the, one of the uh, visions of Saul Lefmore as dean. And he claims that the, the, the basic context for them today and the way they operate today are what was the original vision. I don't remember quite that way, but he was a dean. Uh, but uh, the, the in between, there were a number of years, and then I'll talk about the current vision. But uh, in between, for a number of years, they were really understood like faculty workshops, except instead of talking to other faculty, it was a chance to share um, our scholarship with students. And that was, I mean, I think that was a neat model. That was one neat model. Um, uh, but apparently, the original idea, Chicago best ideas, uh, that is um, also the, 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 the rule that, uh, that, that applies for, has applied in the last couple of years, and if, assume some of you have been to some of these before, uh, is that we are to take some other Chicagoans, good idea, best idea, and, uh, and then in some way use that to talk about uh, issues of the day or something about the law school or anything we so choose. So uh, that is what I'm doing. And as you know, if you've seen the, the, um, the publication uh, announcing this, uh, my focus in law and is on the interdisciplinary origins of uh, the law school. Now, I discovered something interesting when I started planning this talk. Um, and once I heard what it was supposed to be and what the rules were, um, is that, uh, that two best ideas have actually been addressed twice in like a two-year period. It's like, okay, we do have more than two ideas. Uh, but it turns out two different people, uh, Genevieve Blake here and Kurt Bradley, both have talked about David Strauss's common law constitutionalism. Maybe some of you have heard both of those. Um, and it turns out that Martha Nussbaum last year, speaking about Ernst Freund, was very much talking about the same founding best idea that I'm talking about today. Now, I actually think that's kind of neat, again, not to shortchange all the other good ideas, um, but because it allows a, a, taking the same idea in very different directions. And um, to make sure that was going to be the case with my talk, I, I watched uh, Martha Nussbaum's talk, and we absolutely take the theme in a different direction. I also learned some things from, um, from her talk, and I can share a little bit of that for those of you who haven't already seen the Martha Nussbaum uh, 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 talk. Uh, but uh, in a nutshell, uh, both of us are focusing on this founding idea that the law school curriculum, we'll say more about this, but uh, was intentionally and unusually, compared to other law schools, interdisciplinary uh, and meant to be. Um, and um, she really carried that through to think about choices about curriculum and what it means to train lawyers and how that's evolved and some controversies associated with that, very much about uh, thinking about curriculum in, in your education. Um, you can think of what I'm doing as much more focusing on what was intended, what was meant to be set into play uh, by that good or original idea of interdisciplinary study of law. And that was a vision about a sort of the engagement of lawyers in law reform. Um, and I'm going to focus on you know, what, what that looks like in my, in my own area of law, it's law and developmental psychology. Um, and time permitting, dabble a little bit in what that might mean in other areas of law and. Um, I had some fun conversations with uh, legal historian colleagues and some law and economics colleagues um, in anticipation and thinking about how these pieces uh, fit together. So well, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about that founding and the vision. Um, and then um, I'm going to turn to a fairly detailed account of my own sort of the, the particular world, law and developmental psychology, and the profound impact that interdisciplinary work has had on the law in, in recent years. Um, do a little bit of celebrating of the wonders of the great things that have been accomplished that way, and then sound some notes of caution, talk about some things I think that we need to be careful about when we do law and. Um, and again, with time, I'd like to sort of think about those hazards in other areas. Maybe that could also come up in question and answer. I want to make sure to leave time for some questions. Um, and then maybe end with just a little bit of advice to you all. Um, uh, because what I learned from Martha's talk was that the focus, you know, when you heard, when you hear that the University of Chicago Law School was founded on this vision of interdisciplinary, uh, inter interdisciplinarity, you think, oh, they're talking about scholarship, right? That's what, sort of the expectation. And, and no, it was really a focus on how we should be training lawyers. 
And the, the prevailing, um, the preferred sort of method of the time was the case method. Uh, Christopher Columbus Langdell, really his name, um, uh, had developed the, the case method at Harvard. Um, the idea was he was striving to make the study of law like, like a science. And the way to do that is you have to sort of you plumb the depths of some original materials for law that is cases, and you, you know, you're very inward looking. You look at those cases, you derive principles from those cases, uh, you then apply those uh, principles in subsequent cases. And of course, that probably sounds familiar. We have not abandoned the case method in our law school or any other law school. Uh, but that commitment to an only inward look was very much against the grain of what Ernst Freund and others uh, founding the law school here in 1902 uh, had in mind. And their vision was, you know, Sort of recognizing whatever else you're doing, of course, a careful study of law uh, involves many things, including a careful study of cases, uh, but recognizing and really celebrating the importance of outward looking. Other, what do we learn from uh, other disciplines that inform our understanding of the world? Um, he was, Ernst Freund, one of the founders, the focus of Martha Nussbaum's talk, um, was a political scientist at the university before the law school was founded, brought the political science and had an interest in uh, the study of law, including and a study and appreciation of economics and criminology and um, uh, political science, and, uh, uh, political philosophy, among other things, uh, to the study of law. And what part of the emphasis that I also learned from Martha's talk, don't worry, you're not all just going to get a reprise of her talk. I just think there's some important uh, insights that she offered uh, was that it was it, it comported with a vision and ambition for you all as law students. You know what we should be offering in law school that was uh, ambitious for you, that you were not just to become the compliant sort of um, excellent rule followers and implementers. You were going to go out and be in a position uh, to reform the world. That you know, the world is the issues of the, of the 20th century, uh, clearly complex and concerning, and lawyers should play an important role in, in addressing those issues and solving problems. And how do you do that? Well, you should really equip you, in being trained as lawyers, uh, what, with the wisdom that comes from this broad array of disciplines and understandings of our world and our society. Okay, so that vision was very much a vision about curriculum that was looking to what the lawyers we want and what we want, what kind of impact we want lawyers to be able to have uh, in the world. And interestingly, last comment about what Martha said um, in her talk was that it was really not focused much on research, but the thought was the research will follow. I thought that was an interesting comment, but um, I, I think that that happened, right? So the idea of an engaged interdisciplinary approach to legal education brought with it and really sort of, you know, uh, very much um, uh, uh, supported the development of interdisciplinary scholarship. Of course, most famously here, law and economics, but not by any means only, but that's a, a sort of a great example of the kind of thing that sort of developed as research, but then ultimately spilled over to important legal reforms. And um, so I would say some combination of we train lawyers to go out and be part of that reform, and we do we stay here and do research that is part of that reform uh, is really a, a story of, of you know, the, the, what grew from the seed uh, planted by, by the Freund uh, vision, that interdisciplinary vision. Okay, so um, I want to spend some time introducing you to the, my interdisciplinary world um, and, and particularly do it by telling uh, the story of recent developments, uh, particularly led by, by the Supreme Court. So many of you know that I focus on the law affecting children, uh, children's rights, uh, responsibility and, and, and rights of parents connected with raising children, uh, obligations of the state uh, to children and the like. Um, that is a world that has long, in a commonsensical fashion, <laughs> recognized the relevance, the kind of obvious relevance of child development, right? Since we all start out as babies um, and become something very different by the time we are, the age has changed, but 18, 21, whatever you're gonna call adulthood, um, uh, the political theory, the common law, everything on which our legal system is grounded has long recognized that there is this process of development that matters. And it matters for the powers and the duties that we give to parents, right? It matters for the qualifications of our rights and responsibilities we afford to children. It matters for the obligations we impose upon 
the state. That has long been recognized. Your common sense, of course, that, you know, that's child development, but it's not uh, uh, sophisticated developmental psychology, right? So occasionally you see uh, occur, showing up in cases toward the mid-late 20th century uh, references to developmental psychologists. And one most famously, some people from class know this, um, Justice Douglas in his dissent in Wisconsin versus Yoder, um, and, and that's a case in which the Amish parents were arguing that as they had a right, parental right, religious right, to take their children out of school in high school, um, and Justice Douglas uh, dissented in part, arguing that children's independent views on this topic were important to be taken into consideration. And he, pretty long footnote, uh, footnotes to developmental psychologists who focused on moral and cognitive development, and including adolescent development, including Piaget and Colbert, to support the idea that at this age, um, yeah, young people are in a position to have, um, have views on this subject, and, it, and they also have the implication is their interest, their rights should also be uh, taken into account. But for the most part, uh, until quite recently, the developmental psychology was sort of acknowledged in, a, in this commonsensical way. Um, that changed in the context of law focused originally on the juvenile death penalty, and I just want to tell you a little bit about sort of how that played out. There were domestic law developments and international law developments that put a lot of pressure on the issue of America's um, allowance of, you know, leaving to the states. Oops. Oh, that makes me wonder. Am I being heard? Oh, am I, do I know that? Oh, you've been able to hear me all along? Or all of a sudden? Okay, great. Um, if, if you ever can't hear me, please let me know. Because I, when I hit that, it was like the loudest thing I'd heard. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, uh, um, so uh, the two American important domestic, sort of two in a row, I mean, there was a lot of development in, in, in death penalty of, over the, in the second half of the 20th century. But um, uh, in one year apart, two cases, Thomas versus Oklahoma, and then uh, Stanford versus Kentucky, uh, together determined that it was unconstitutional, a violation of the Eighth Amendment, to impose the death penalty for homicides committed by people younger than 16, but then Stanford, not unconstitutional to impose the death penalty on 16-year-olds uh, and 17-year-olds who had committed murder. Um, those, that sort of was the understanding of the sort of this, here's where we are. The United States allows at least some uh, uh, capital punishment for juvenile homicides. Meanwhile, the international developments are very heavily away from this, and America is uh, increasingly perceived as just being you know, barbaric for uh, ever executing people who committed um, murder as uh, before they are turned uh, 18. So a lot of pressure, a lot of interest in uh, move, changing the law, even though there's this pretty recent 1989 Stanford decision that suggests you know, it may be pretty hard to change the law so soon. And it led to a collaboration uh, between lawyers, law professors on the one hand, uh, developmental psychologists, as among others, criminologists and others, but, but pr principally developmental psychologists, um, to sort of hash out a new argument that was grounded in developmental science. Um, and uh, the, the kind of leader on the lawyer side uh, was a woman, Elizabeth Scott, a law professor, Columbia, formerly Virginia. And the leader on the developmental psychology side was Lawrence Steinberg, who is really, I think, the leading developmental psychologist on, um, on issues of adolescence. Or broadly, who's engaged in any kind of um, uh, discussions of law and law reform. So they collaborated. And their collaboration, I thought, was really something that sort of reflects what I would call sort of the best in interdisciplinary work. They were very committed to learning from one another's disciplines. So uh, the developmental psychologist, led by Lauren Steinberg, sort of studied at the feet of the lawyers kind of what matters to law in thinking about things like culpability, right, in some detail. Right, and and the lawyers focused, you know, with some subtlety on what are the distinctive features that matter in terms of uh, adolescent development that might bear on this, right? And together they ended up kind of coming up with an account um, that linked specific grounds for mitigation already recognized in the criminal law to specific aspects of developmental psychology that were sort of increasingly appreciated as, as, as uh, distinct to, uh, to adolescents. So there's a list of three. So diminished decision-making capacity as a ground for mitigation was tied to adolescents' um, impulsive decision-making and extra, you know, sort of manifestation of bad judgment uh, in, in their decision-making. Vulnerability to coercion and duress, 
Brown for mitigation was linked to adolescents' greater vulnerability to negative social pressures, you know, classically peer pressure, and their difficulty extricating themselves from the circumstances which impose that pressure. Um, out of character behavior, that, that ground for mit mitigation uh, was linked to the idea that young people's characters are less formed, they're less fixed, right? So the idea is it's not as much a manifestation of their character. That was the, and, that. and all of this was woven together and accounted for uh, in some detail, written up in articles, in some form showed up in amicus briefs, and ultimately, in a very reduced form, and that's one thing I'm gonna talk about, uh, showed up in the opinion of Justice Kennedy in the Ropers versus Simmons case, which found, the outlawed juvenile death penalty, but found unconstitutional not many years after Stanford, uh, a, uh, uh, a, that any imposition of the, the death penalty for those who committed homicide prior to turning 18 um, was a cruel and unusual punishment, violated the Eighth Amendment. Um, and after that sort of, that led to a sort of an embrace of this idea that uh, we can, we can sort of make judgments about culpability that uh, uh, are tied to our understanding of, devel of, of developmental psychology that led to a series of cases focused on and, there, and, and very significantly uh, constraining uh, the, uh, the application of life without parole uh, for youth who committed um, crimes uh, before uh, they turned 18. And in the process of that so series of cases that followed in short order, uh, neuroscience also came into the picture. So brain science, we, there, there was an argument that these behavioral accounts, we now can sort of point to the, what's going on in the brain, um, uh, MRIs and then functional MRIs that demonstrated what was connecting and what was how developed uh, that supported this idea that, that young people are different in ways that, that should matter, right? Um, uh, so um, there is a lot to celebrate about that interdisciplinary result. I mean, I think at a conceptual level, the idea that the court recognizes and appreciates the importance of having you know, if they're, gonna, if they're gonna hinge differences in legal treatment on what is different about children, understanding what is different subtly um, in all its detail uh, is uh, uh, and taking that into account in, 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 in designing a legal regime is a, just a conceptual advance. Um, just in human cost, you know, people are alive. <laughs> who, who wouldn't have been? Um, and uh, many people who had been uh, sentenced originally to life without parole because those decisions were determined to be retroactive um, are now uh, no longer incarcerated. Um, uh, and maybe as important, the, the language and this embrace of the relevance of developmental psychology uh, galvanized and sort of gave, some, gave real force to reform movements throughout juvenile justice systems, which have changed many other aspects of, of those systems that aren't tied to death penalty, life without parole, or the Eighth Amendment, just sort of a reconception of how we take development into account and how to effectively respond uh, to juvenile crime. All very positive, all things that I celebrate. Um, maybe especially because I'm so happy with the results and because this is an area I, I know well, I feel like I'm well, um, well qualified to be a critic, right? I'm not just, I'm not someone who's skeptic from the outside saying, yeah, here are the problems. Some of the other things I might have a chance to talk about a little bit, I might fall more into that category. Um, so I, what I, what I want to do is first list a number of things, sort of notes of caution, and then I'm going to circle back to each of them in the context of this, of this series of cases um, uh, uh, to, to sort of to, to flesh them out. Okay, so and first, just very briefly, um, one uh, is this issue of kind of quality, right? Just sort of the concern that the law in turning to and sort of borrowing from or, or bringing, bringing things in from other disciplines uh, can do so in a way, you know, worst case scenario, just sloppy, but at least likely to be reductive, right? Um, uh, number one. Number two uh, is the concern that this interdisciplinary work is often reflects, uh, it sort of ends driven. It reflects, you know, there's a choice, people already know where they wanna go and they look to a discipline uh, to get support. And I'll talk about the, the concerns connected with that. Uh, part of the concern is it buries the real reasons uh, for uh, why we do things in, in law. Um, third is the need for the law to fix things, right? To make things fixed. <laughs> um, uh, where they're off, when, when we're doing interdisciplinary work, we're relying on disciplines that are committed to ongoing development and change. 
Um, fourth is unintended or unforeseen consequences that can flow, right? We make a decision in law in a particular area. We say things about the connection between law and development that has implications or could have implications that we haven't thought through in other areas. Um, and fifth, and you could say in a way this, you know, this is the, the, this is the one that matters the most, um, is that there is the potential for the law to relinquish its own responsibilities, to abdicate to other fields that are offering we're purported to offer answers. Um, OK, so let me consider each of these one at a time in the context of the Roper, that's the death penalty case line of, of cases. Um, so first, the issue of quality. I mean, I think that Roper is a nice illustration uh, for, uh, for what to worry about here. So I mentioned that the developmental psychologists and lawyers who work together um, worked on a very subtle account for this is what the law the criminal law says and this is how we think about what might mitigate responsibility and this is how it matches up with developmental psychology is what we know about adolescence. Essentially what Kennedy did, Kennedy wrote the opinion, is he sort of took that list of three things about child development that were different and said, you know, therefore they're less culpable. I'm not being quite fair, but it's not so far from that. It certainly washes away the detailed work uh, that had been uh, produced when the, with, with, the, with the interdisciplinary co collaboration. So it's, it isn't, you know, the account of why less culpable, what is this, you know, what's the story here, um, is, is sort of disappears. Now, would it have made a difference in the particular case? No, a more kind of careful hashing out, I don't think would have made any difference in the particular, in the application in the Roper case. Um, but we should still worry, as we, we, we have a subtly developed complicated law for a reason. And unless the interdisciplinary wisdom raises questions about that, those complexities, which sometimes might, it's like they're actually suggesting differences that don't exist, or in some other kind of way, there's sort of a problem with the complexity, um, we might get that insight. But if we're not getting that insight from the other discipline, uh, then we should beware of an importation of another discipline that kind of knocks away uh, uh, what, what, uh, you know, what is our otherwise subtle account that has been developed through the lawmaking process. Um, uh, so the, the other worry is uh, that what Kennedy ended up doing is producing a kind of blunt instrument of an account of developmental psychology. I was sort of, it was more subtle in the sense that it appreciated develop the, the psychosocial development and not just cognitive development, which was sort of an advance. Um, but it has these sort of this list of three and it describes them in this very general term and it doesn't tie them very tightly to particular law. We now have this kind of declaration of, of um, you know, what, what our understanding of, develop, of, of adolescent development and its relevance to law, which I think, um, produces danger for what I'll talk about later, which is the unintended, the unforeseen consequences. Um, we need to be especially worried about the loss of subtlety, the reductive approach, um, when, uh, when, the, when it's an ends-driven turn to interdisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary work. And um, I, I, I take this concern. Again, I'm very happy with the results in Roper, but I take, I, I take the concern that if you, were, if you think that the only reason that Kennedy got to where he got and used the, the science the way he used it is because that's where he wanted to get it and it made it easy, um, you, it delegitimizes what he's done, right? Um, so I'm going to quote a couple times from Scalia's dissent in Roper um, because Scalia, it, you know, says things in dissent to say, you know, I vehemently disagree with, with, the, with the court. Um, I, I take them to say they offer some wisdom about what we need to worry about going forward. Um, so in this context, Scalia says, today's opinion provides a perfect example of why judges are ill-equipped to make the type of legislative judgments the court insists on making here. To support its opinion this, that states should be prohibited from imposing the death penalty on anyone who committed murder before age 18, the court looks to scientific and sociological studies, picking and choosing those that support its position. It never explains why those particular studies are methodologically sound. None was ever entered into evidence or tested in the adversarial process. In other words, all the court has done today, to borrow from another context, is to look over the heads of the crowd and pick out its friends. Now, I don't think that's particularly, I mean, I think in this context, the developmental psychology is very well supported, and I haven't seen sort of lots of alternative theories that sort of shake the general account of what the developmental psychologists uh, were offering. Um, but I do think he points to some real dangers. I mean, if we, if we look at 
you know, where did the information come from that Kennedy relies on? It came from amicus briefs, which you know, was citing the American Psychological Association and other experts. Uh, but as those who have taken evidence with me know, I sort of rail against the fact that sort of, uh, or you know, that unlike uh, the 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 test for the quality of expertise that comes in in the context of an adversarial process adjudication kind of facts that, that, that courts are allowed to take into consideration in appellate litigation, just whatever comes in the amicus brief that, that sort of potentially suits their fancy. There's no peer review. Um, there's no opportunity for real, for real contest. And there's a danger that there's sort of the gloss of the expertise um, is sort of trotted in, uh, not necessarily um, uh, as, as reliable and as uh, dispositive as, as it is suggested to be. I think there are a couple concerns, even if we say, in this case, no worries whatsoever. The developmental psychology relied upon was excellent, and really no reason to think we should question it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one is just the one already highlighted by uh, Scalia's comment, I think, which is, if you're not already in that camp, and, you, and you, you, this skepticism leads, it just has no persuasive power whatsoever. Instead of saying like, well, I really have to pause because I'm learning something new, wisdom, right, from this discipline. It's just like, okay, well, that's very convenient. You've pulled something off a shelf to make your argument. So there's that problem, no persuasive power. People are already persuaded, just have another argument, right? Um, uh, the other concern that I've already mentioned is this idea that I think it really has a danger of hiding the real reason. Why, what, what motivated a view that this was the right result before there was the turn, right? Least worried if you sort of had a were totally neutral and turned to your other discipline and the other discipline gives you information that helps you answer a question. But you think you already know where you're going and you look to that other discipline, we might worry that what is not being addressed is why. Why, why did you already think you knew where you're going? What is really motivating um, uh, the result? Okay, so third, the laws need to fix, uh, fix you know, when, it's, when it's relying on other disciplines that are designed to and continue to develop. So um, you know, we know our common law system is a system that allows for change and development in law. I'm a believer in the li living constitution and, and all of that good stuff. And I think you had another Chicago Best Ideas talk I think, so I'll let more talk about evolution. Presumably you engaged <laughs> this thinking about how, uh, how the law engages in a, and, and responds to and is, itself changes, all good. But clearly one value of law is to be stable, right? To be something that is, uh, doesn't keep changing, that we can rely upon, that we can, you know, we, we trust in and rely on our precedents. We, we can build uh, our, our lives and our decision uh, on, on, um, on that kind of stability. Right? So that is something that we need from our law. Right? We need an answer that's not going to change tomorrow. Um, most of the disciplines, certainly social sciences and science, is, is all about, you know, it keeps expecting, it's we're never done. It's just, you know, it's constantly expecting uh, to update and to change. And, and it should, right? Um, uh, so an example of this that has pressed um, hard in the context of, of uh, the law affecting children, something I've recently written about, but sort of generally something that is getting a, a lot of attention these days, is that all of the developmental psychology and also now the neuroscience that was relied upon in Roper in this line of cases to support a distinctive law for, for children up to 18 really doesn't support the, the age of 18. Right, it supports the idea that there's change, but it's continuing, and it really keeps going into the 20s. And so, if it's if what you're really doing is about is really deferring to this what's happening with development, then we need to do we keep rethinking where we put the age. And as we get more subtle, should we get more subtle about our age lines? And right, there's a kind of um, threat to stability with a that could come with a kind of suggestion that the only reason we're doing this is because the developmental psychology provides the answers. Okay, unforeseen consequences. Um, these things fit together, I think. Um, sort of the less subtle and nuanced our application of the, uh, the, the other discipline, uh, the more we need to worry about that blunt instrument showing up and wreaking havoc in some other area of the law. Um, and and I, the huge looming example of this in, in, in the law affecting children is the impact that what, you know, what the court has said um, in the context of, of sort of addressing culpability in the, in the criminal context what impact that will have on ongoing development of children's autonomy rights. Um, now, the kind of the basic way this is often framed is, well, now the court is saying that you know, 
juveniles are terrible decision makers, and you know, how do we square that with the fact that they need to be good decision makers um, uh, in order to, um, uh, to exercise autonomy? But I think it's a little more complicated than that. I want to uh, note that Scalia, again, raises this concern as a challenge, like this is why I'm not signing on to Roper, uh, but raises a challenge that is, it, it was recently uh, uh, asserted again in a kind of reductive form by Thomas, Justice Thomas. But, but here's the concern. He's comparing what the American Lo uh, Psychological Association said in the context of, of the Roper case about, um, well, I'll say in a second, um, with what the American Psychological Association said about child development in the context of cases addressing minors' authority to exercise decision-making authority to have an abortion uh, with limited or no impact, in, input from their parents. Okay, so here's what he says. The American Psychological Association, which claims in, in an amicus brief here, in this case, that scientific evidence shows persons under 18 lack the ability to take moral responsibility for their decisions, has previously taken precisely the opposite position before this court. In its brief in Hodgson versus Minnesota, the APA found a, quote, rich body of research showing that juveniles are mature enough to decide whether to obtain an abortion without parental involvement. The APA brief, citing psychological treatises and studies too numerous to list, asserted, quote, by middle adolescent ages 14 to 15, much younger, of course, than the ceiling uh, for Roper, young people develop abilities similar to adults in reasoning about moral dilemmas, understanding social rules and laws, and reasoning about interpersonal relationships and interpersonal problems. So there has, that has prompted a, dia a dialogue, and the developmental psychologists who are sort of leading, the, leading the, the charge have pushed back, I think very effectively, to say that's way too simple. The idea that sort of all decision making is the same, dis distinguish between cold decision making in the context of a sort of deliberate decision in a doctor's office uh, about uh, whether to have an abortion versus the hot decision making, you know, standing around with your friends uh, on the street about whether you engage in, in crime. I think it only takes you part of the way and it doesn't really say anything about Issue, other issues that are identified as what's different in matters uh, in Roper, including the context of peer pressure and sort of the, all those sort of context issues that children don't have control over that can skew uh, the decision-making process. Um, and, and I think the least attended to so far, but of real concern for me in the future, uh, is the third characteristic that, that, that Kennedy identifies in Roper, which is this unfixed character. I think it is coming. <laughs> Someone will argue that, uh, that young people, their lack of fixed character means they are really not in a position to exercise autonomy because they are not yet fixed in who they are. And the whole idea is we give, us, give individuals control over our own best interests with an, uh, some sense of continuity of, of self that may not be the, the right way to understand, according to the, the, the court, um, an, adolescent, an adolescent still developing. So where might this come up? Well, there is a pr proliferation of legislation, um, as I'm sure you've all heard, it's gotten a lot of attention um, under different names, but sort of prohibiting tr uh, transitioning treatments, it's often the language that's used. Um, and the, the, there are a lot of parental rights issues implicated as well, but clearly part of it is their, their autonomy. How much are we letting children make decisions? Um, uh, and interestingly, I mean, I think, Strikingly, some of, the, some of that legislation doesn't even draw the line at 18. It's older than 18. You know, developmental psychology is sort of ready to be served up in that context to suggest that we're really talking about a period and understanding of sort of immaturity and under, ongoing immaturity uh, that may be marshaled in support of that legislation against uh, autonomy challenges by, uh, by, by uh, those representing children. Um, okay, so finally, and most importantly, uh, uh, um, so I think sort of following all of these uh, hazards is the ultimate concern uh, that in turning to other disciplines, we may, we as law, you know, people engaged in the making of law, I like to say that a little bit uh, pompously, but you know, in, engaged in, in uh, addressing law and, and, and proposing law reforms and the like, uh, the danger is that we may be releasing, uh, relinquishing some of, the, of law's own responsibility uh, in the process. Um, so in Roper, what I would point to is the, the example of this, is that, um, that basically what Kennedy says, the sort of the way he frames things is, you know, these three differences mean that you know, minors are less culpable. No. 
developmental psychology does not decide who's culpable or what culpability means and what flows from culpability, right? That's law. And it, we, we can be better informed and more subtle in how we think about and how we justify how we're defining culpability and what we do about it and how we think about how that might change with age. Uh, but we don't defer, as I think a lot of the language after, uh, in and after Roper suggests, is sort of the develop, you know, put it, look at the brain, look at that. It's much less developed here, less culpable. It doesn't tell us that, right? The law takes that into account, must take it into account, and then make decisions about how, um, how, how to, to uh, frame culpability and how to understand it. Related to that is, I think, another way that law abdicates is it sort of suggests that we look to, de you know, it's all about capacity, for example. So we look to developmental psychology to answer, to fill in. What do we know about capacity? Well, law affects capacity, right? And the kind of the way we structure law that affects how children are raised and how they're educated and the role that they play in their own lives and the role that their parents play in their lives. Um, all will have an important impact on who they become. And so the, another way of relinquishing responsibility is acting like it's all set in process and the developmental psychologist will give us the answers and we'll plug that in. No, law is an active part of that, about the, of that developmental process and it can't lose sight of that. How are we doing on time? Okay, great. Um, so, well, I wanted to look at this because I want to turn to, and I feel like, you know, I've, so far I've stayed in my lane. <laughs> I'm now proposing really, screeching right out of my lane. And, and, I, and this was a really fun aspect of sort of when I was thinking about what I was going to say uh, today, I, um, I solicited input from a number of colleagues, and particularly legal historians and, and some of our many law and economics faculty. And I sort of described really roughly what I'm thinking of and something, and it just asked for them to sort of offer examples. And it was great for me. I mean, really, one of Chicago's best ideas is we love talking to each other. We always learn from each other. Um, and um, so I'm most grateful for that. I mean, here I was sitting and reading an articles about antitrust thinking, well, what am I doing? And then, of course, Randy Picker sent me some slides. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, all of that is, it was, was, um, was terrifically informative for me. But I'm quite wary of bringing too much of that to you because, really, the lane issue is important. I mean, if I'm talking about not being careless and drawing on other disciplines, I also should not be careless in suggesting I know things I don't know. But I'm going to just hazard a few examples that sort of allow you to start sort of, you know, this is, this is, these are issues that you confront uh, in, in your classes and your discussions with one another. So things for you to sort of play around with and explore uh, that I'll just, uh, that I think might be illustrations of some of the same kind of hazards. Um, so in the area of, so I'll give one example. I think the right number to, to make sure we have time for questions might be just one ish, one or two but examples from each of these. So legal history. Um, Perhaps some of you can already predict um, an area where uh, we would say sort of law and history um, is being done and having a real impact on the shape of law controversially, right? So originalism. Um, and um, what's interesting, uh, I got a lot of really wonderful uh, things to, to read where historians, historians, you know, they're not lawyers, not law ands, just historians, were engaging with originalists, law ands. Um, and uh, about the history they were doing, um, and, um, and being critical, right? And I'll talk a little bit about the criticism, but to emphasize, the historians were not independently taking a view about whether it was the right place to look to interpret the Constitution today. That was not their business, right? Their business was, if you're going to do history, do it right. And, um, and, and of course, there's a I want to say right now a range of what people mean by originalism and, of course, a vast uh, array of different historians who take different approaches. So this is one example uh, that I found really interesting and um, uh, just made me feel like I could understand what the, sort of the, the historian perspective in a way that I, that I hadn't appreciated before. I think it's an example that captures uh, problems one and two, right? So the reductiveness and the ends-driven aspect, or maybe it's driven by the ends-driven aspect, produces this kind of reductive approach. So my, col my colleague, Alison LaCroix, gave me a, sort of a back and forth uh, posting between the historian Jonathan Geenap and the originalist Randy Barnett. Um, and um, basically what Geenap does is he challenges the originalist assumption, and I'm going to do some quoting here, that the era of the American founding is rather easily accessible, that is not that different from the conceptual world in which we currently reside. Right? So the idea is it's not that many years ago in the grand scheme of things. You know, um, if I have more time, I'll tell you an example that Dick Helmel told me from the Middle Ages, um, uh, and, which was really a surprise and interesting. Oh, what a, what a, what a little 
teaser. Um, okay, but um, uh, so uh, uh, so not that long ago, speaking English, we kind of had the same dialect. Like, like you know, that's not that much change, right? Was it? And um, and what? What Gnap observes uh, is that um, it's just a mistaken idea that we can just read, you know, we can just read these texts and sort of read these texts, update by almost like using a kind of word trans, like Google, Google Word Translator, we sort of atomistically update what seems a little antiquated and get some kind of contemporary understanding of what that reader in the in the um, uh, the time of the founding would understand. So Gnap says to the contrary, right? Um, uh, it's like when you do any kind of history, and 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 he says there's plenty of reason to think that you that going back to our founding is plenty long enough to have this implicated. It's like traveling to another country, right? If you're really going to understand that other country, you, you can't just kind of have your Google Translator, a little book about you know when they wear this kind of clothing. It means you have to really get to know the culture. You have to live there. You need to learn the language, right? And compares that says it's the same thing when you travel in time. You really need to engage, and what does that mean for an historian? It means this sort of this sort of soaking up every single original uh, uh, source and doing what you can to sort of undo this very complicated uh, puzzle. Um, and so, a little bit more quote, and then I'll stop giving with this example. But so, what uh, what Gnab says is, all historians can do is immerse themselves as fully as possible, reading as many sources as they can, checking and revising their working assumptions as they proceed. Even if his approach cannot guarantee complete historical understanding, its great advantage is that it forces the interpreter to first prove, rather than merely assume, that what appears familiar is, in fact, so. This is the approach that founding era American historians have long used to so successfully clarify the confusing and contradictory features of the period's intellectual artifacts. Confusion and contradictions, he suggests, that the originalists just don't notice. Um, so I thought that was a you know, really interesting you know, way of sort of plumbing what it would mean to do this in a complicated, subtle way. Again, doesn't tell you that that's where we should go, but if we're gonna go there, let's do it right. I thought that was um, uh, a, a nice illustration of that. So a little bit about law and economics. It's not like I'm really even farther out of my lane. Um, uh, but, and, and, and as I say, sort of lots of thoughts from lots of different colleagues. I just touch on a couple really quickly, and some of you will be sort of more familiar with some of this already. I mean, one, of course, is the contribution of cost-benefit analysis, and we we'll say a little bit more about that, right? It was embraced during the Reagan era, which was all over deregulation anyway, right? So there's this real perception of an ends-driven move, um, which I think hurt what is valuable about sort of an insight that we should be paying attention or really thinking about costs and benefits and in, in, as, in as subtle and complete a way as we can uh, because it was so associated with ends-driven uh, approach and because it was done in a very narrow reductive way when it was originally applied uh, to, uh, to, de to deregulation. I mean, I think partly thanks to my many wonderful colleagues who think about these things, there's been a real pushback to push at what really ought to be taken into account for example, when we're thinking about costs and benefits uh, much more deeply, again, that complexity and that subtlety. Um, and also what I would put in the category of that sort of law ensuring that it preserves its own responsibility, an acknowledgment that economics is often completely disregarding of something that matters a great deal to law, which is distributional effects, right? So good movement forward, I think, in reforms appreciates some of that sort of initial ends-driven reductive application um, and, is trying to, and is trying to move beyond that. And so, to some extent, it successfully has uh, moved beyond it. I think because of the timing, I'm not going to give the antitrust example of unforeseen consequences, but again, a little teaser. Um, but I do want to sort of, I, I want to end by just sort of summing up in, a, in, in the form of giving you a bit of advice, because uh, remember, the best idea that I'm talking about is an idea that was really focused on you all, how you're being educated, and, and what, the, what kind of lawyers you will become. Um, so when you encounter interdisciplinary theories, interdisciplinary analysis in your classes, you know, contemplating deploying it uh, yourselves, um, uh, remember that the idea is to look to other disciplines to gain wisdom, to gain insight, that almost always should mean it makes things more complicated. Um, so um, the, so, the, so the, the real value often, I think, of interdisciplinary work, and I'm seeing this a lot in the world of evidence, it's another context which sort of goes beyond what I had time to talk about here, is that it's, we're just 
other disciplines, their cognitive psychology is helping ask questions now. It's far, far away from actually answering them, but it's just helping us, gives us pause. It should make us humble. It should not make us sort of brash, confident, certain uh, 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 lawmakers. Um, so if resorting to another discipline makes answers to hard questions easy, beware, right? The other discipline may simply be hiding from view or taking off the table something that is essential to the complete and just understanding of uh, uh, and application of law, right? That is the, that's the real message. Um, of course, the law can't dither forever. The law can't just say, wow, things are really subtle, so we'll never know, right? Um, uh, the law has to come up with answers, right? It has to do its best. And it will do better if it is trying to look to other disciplines in doing so. Uh, but the point is, ultimately, those other disciplines can't, you know, bring the law all the way to resolution, right? That, uh, you know, the deference to some other discipline uh, is never uh, going uh, uh, to, to get the job done, right? You can't defer to what's on the other side of the ampersand. Ultimately, it's the job uh, of law, your profession. Uh, so look to those disciplines to gain the, that wisdom, to give you pause, uh, and then uh, look forward to doing the, the, the hard, deep work of law doing and lawmaking. All right, thank you. And, um, um, you mentioned the line drawing problem with age and decision making. And so when you were talking about the use of MRIs and other brain scanning uh, technology to kind of look at uh, how decisions are made, I sort of thought of you know, studies that indicate uh, a large, a disproportionate number of uh, incarcerated individuals suffer from uh, TBIs or other brain injuries um, in childhood or adolescence. So I'm just wondering where, how, how do you anticipate the law going in terms of uh, using brain science in the future? OK, so um, that is sort of talking right to something I just recently um, wrote about. And I, I want to just sort of briefly say anticipate, tough call, what I think should happen. What I think you're flagging is, Make sure I'm getting this right, because you, you particularly talked about brain injuries in childhood, right? Um, uh, but I think an interesting question that is pressed by the, sort of the, the, the increasing sophistication of law for children that is, tries to sort of look to development and look to the brain, say, brain science to justify and to explain is that it should press those same questions for adults. It's like, or at least we need to explain why don't we pay attention. If we say it matters, look at the brain. Um, why does it suddenly, maybe it matters only because it's, it's, you know, it's developmentally healthy and that, that we're willing to say the sort of aberrational gets punished in a different way. Maybe that's the answer, but then say that. I mean, say why you're treating these, um, uh, the, the, the same factors differently when we're talking about minors. So I think that's a very interesting question to ask. What do I anticipate will happen in the law? I mean, I don't think, I think the law is very slow to change. There's a kind of, there's a general accepted idea that we can draw this line between childhood and adulthood. And in a lot of contexts, you see it gets more subtle as we try to learn more about child development. And it doesn't carry over to like, huh, what assumptions are we making about adults? And maybe we should revisit some of that as well. Um, I was just interested in, in terms of some of these challenges and risks, like what you think the role of people who are working in these areas, like having, I guess especially within the law school community, having formal training, like advanced degrees in these areas. So I think that's something I've noticed varies between different disciplines in terms of like how you get visited. Like everyone in legal history tends to have three PhDs, I think, um, not as true in other areas. Um, so yeah. It's a really interesting question, and no, I don't have a degree in psychology. I've, all, I've often thought about how fun it would be to go back and, and get a PhD now that I kind of have this kind of this spent this time. Um, and a lot of our, you know, we have a blend with the economists. You know, some we have a lot of economy economics PhDs, and we have a lot of people doing law and economics who don't. Um, so you're right, legal history. Sort of the idea is that you're learning a set of methods for historical research uh, that is sort of hard to pick up. I mean, that said, I think that we see people who do, I mean, you sometimes hear, sometimes Will Bode is referred to as an illegal historian. And you know, I know this, being, you know, he's not really, a, he's not a legal historian, but he may have some very interesting things to say because he can engage in, 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 uh, in careful work. But he would, I would think, be the first who would want to hear from historians about what he might be missing and what he needs to pursue. It's interesting, the article that I quoted flagged a couple um, non-history trained people that, that he thought were particularly good at, at doing what was called for. 
Uh, so it, it can be done. I mean, I think, you know, it just underlines the humility theme. It's just don't, don't you know, there's a, it all looks really easy if you don't really know too much about it. Um, and, and that's the danger. But I think, you know, I hope in the academy, at least at this place, we're very serious about trying to make sure we are, um, you know, if we don't have that degree, we are, we are being well-schooled by people who do. And, and I, for example, try to, you know, always give stuff I write that says anything about developmental psychology to Larry Steinberg, among other people, because he's very generous. But, um, uh, but, it, but it's, it's, it's a nice question. I mean, I think people who are double-trained are much more likely to be able to sort of have the full toolkit that bespeaks the wisdom that we think we're deriving from those other fields. I had a question that if interdisciplinarity is such a strong value within legal education, is there a risk that perhaps lawyers have a hammer and start looking at a problem like jail? Lawyers think that they should be involved in all the world's social problems, or maybe that is the case. Maybe the law should encompass all these things, and so it's best to be interdisciplinary. So, are risk lawyers get too involved, or is it just best preparing lawyers to be involved in the broader problem of our society? Well, I mean, I. I think lawyers can't be involved enough in terms of kind of thinking about what law has to say about you know the situations we find ourselves in in the world. Um, but there is the danger of the kind of ever hammer looks like a nail. I think in the interdisciplinary work. But right, I would say, you know, I don't think there's any. I mean, is is there a? I mean, I guess I guess lawyers don't have much to say about how to do surgery, right? I'm not sure I can immediately think about some obvious value to lawyers jumping in. But of course, lawyers have a lot to say about matters of regulation that impact the medical care we provide and the like, right? So um, I, I guess, you know, again, the message of humility, there might be contexts in which it's really mostly not about law or mostly the law needs to figure out how to make a space for, for something else. Um, uh, and that's the work of the law. But I mean, I think the starting point is, what, you know, with that question, what, what might the law be able to do? And then let's get it right if the law is stepping in. Yes, in the back row. Yeah, you. I'm in mean, the back row with people sitting in it, right? Uh, about like when you know, like to turn to vote discipline, and what kind of what you're supposed to turn to. Because so in your kind of story, you about the juvenile death penalty. You're like, you know, the law of children kind of commonsensically recognize stuff about development, and so like let's think about it more seriously and more rigorously. But like, what if you know? Should you be turning to other disciplines when the law hasn't like already kind of built it in and done it in another way? Or like some, you know, you might think that um, punishments for children have to turn less on like their development or and more on the, like political participation and like how how do you know which discipline to turn to? And when. Okay, a couple things to say. For one is, I mean, we're, I'm, I'm sort of as, my starting assumption when we're thinking about law reform is there's an identified problem. Right, and we're sort of law is engaged in some kind of a way. You know, cases are brought, or people are making passing legislation, or whatever, to try to address a problem. And then I would say, I mean, you look around as broadly as you can about everything that's going to help you get it as right as you can. <laughs> and maybe sometimes that's obvious. Maybe sometimes it's not so obvious. And maybe there isn't always somewhere to look. So that's sort of answer number one. Answer number two is one of the things um, in one of the examples I didn't get to, the antitrust example that I really loved, is that part of the story and sort of the challenge of where things might have kind of gone awry with a sort of law and economics influence is that the lawmakers applying law and economics had forgotten their history. It's like, OK, so it's really law ands, right? So we have to recognize that they're very often. And in fact, like for example, developmental psychology, sure, but also criminology, right? There are, there, there are going to be other um, disciplines that are going to matter a lot for thinking about um, uh, you know, even, even the issues that I'm talking about. But so no magic answer. I, I mean, I like the idea that like, if you're in a world that you know, addressing law and they're sort of not looking to anything else, is there necessarily something shallow about that? And I would say not if you feel like you have the equipment to uh, to address your problems, um, but if it if problems seem insoluble or it's you know then then look for tools. Okay, lots there, and I also see that we're past the lunch time, so I will try to sort of do justice. And I also appreciate for the recording. I'm not sure how much of that is heard. And I don't want to repeat the whole thing, uh, but um, but there are a couple questions. One is to what extent is sort of basically there's sort of this kind of back and forth deference where law buys into some kind of categories and sort of 
presents those, what's a normal, what's abnormal, and then, then the psychology works within them. And then the other idea is sort of when, when, does, like, when does law care about its psychological insights and when doesn't it, right? So I, I think the first one is a real, I mean, concern wouldn't be quite the word. It's another reason to be aware. It's like, yes, we are not only each in our own worlds, but those worlds have, you know, we are in a society <laughs> that has certain ideas about things that, that manifest in these different disciplines in a way that may be reinforcing in a way that is actually counter to the kind of progress. I mean, within developmental psychology, this idea that we sort of only cared about development up until, you know, we called people adults was around for a long time before developmental psychologists started saying like, you know, you know, we keep changing. <laughs> Maybe we should think about developmental psychology as something that goes through the lifespan and there are times of great change and, that, and all of that should matter. So yes, it's an issue. Yes, it requires subtlety and awareness. I'm not sure, you know, I don't know there's magic fix. It's a good thing to appreciate. Uh, the other issue I think um, goes to this ends driven idea that there is support for the idea that young people are, you know, deserving of a second chance and all that. And so we're open to the idea of looking to this uh, psycho the developmental psychology to ascribe lesser culpability. But what's really driving this is sort of a sense of a different attitude about young people. Um, and we're, we're not really sort of relinquishing our law to uh, all insights of developmental and other psychology and saying, you know, these are the things that matter. You, you know, help us make sure we get it right across the board. So there are all kinds of incoherence and inconsistency, which is something that I and others have, have pushed against for the reasons you raised. Okay, you need to eat your lunch. Um, uh, thank you so much for coming.